Israel is once again before the ICJ, this time for public hearings on the consequences of its occupation of Palestinian territories. It's more pressure while its military wages war on Gaza. But does Israel care about international justice and what difference would a verdict make? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Adrian Finnegan. The International Court of Justice is hearing submissions on Israel's occupation of Palestinian territories. It'll consider the legal consequences of Israel's ongoing breach of Palestinians' right to self-determination, as well as how Israeli policies impact not only the occupied areas, but also other countries and the United Nations. Opinion advisories by the UN's top court are non-binding, but carry significant moral and legal authority. So, when a decision is announced, it'll have global implications. Dmitry Medvedenko sets the scene for us. Israel's occupation of historical Palestine began more than 56 years ago. In June 1967, its six-day war against Egypt, Syria and Jordan killed about 16,000 Arabs. Israel took control of the West Bank, East Jerusalem and other areas, forcing hundreds of thousands of Palestinians from their homes. And so began the longest occupation in modern history. The international community has never recognized Israel's annexation of East Jerusalem and the West Bank. Yet they, and the Gaza Strip, remain under Israeli military control today, under the pretext of security. The lives of millions of Palestinians are dictated by hundreds of military checkpoints, a color-coded permit system, and a separation wall. Israel has increasingly expanded Jewish-only settlements, creating a system that privileges Jews over non-Jews. 10% of Israel's population lives in these settlements, which are illegal under international law. Please be seated. Uh, the sitting is open. Now, the UN's top court is weighing in. La cour se réunit ce matin. The court will meet to hear the oral statements and comments on the request for an advisory opinion submitted by the United Nations General Assembly to the court on the question of legal consequences arising from the policies and practices of Israel in the occupied Palestinian territories, including East Jerusalem. During his presentation, Palestinian Foreign Minister Riyad Malki said the only solution is to end Israel's occupation of Palestine unconditionally and immediately. Ending Israel's impunity is a moral, political and legal imperative. Successive Israeli governments have given the Palestinian people only three options. Displacement, subjugation or death. These are the choices, ethnic cleansing, apartheid or genocide. But our people are here to stay. The proceedings will see 52 countries and three international organizations deliver submissions over the course of a week. The case is separate from the one brought by South Africa, which accuses Israel of committing genocide in Gaza. Dmitry Medvedenko, Al Jazeera for Inside Story. We'll go to our guests in just a moment, but first, let's speak to Riyad Malki, the Foreign Minister for the State of Palestine, who joins us now from The Hague. Minister, thank you for being with us on Al Jazeera. What do you expect from the ICJ when it publishes its opinion? Well, uh, we do expect a, a, a historic decision that will uh, put an end to the Israeli <clears throat> impunity, uh, allows for clear accountability and really takes away from uh, Israel that uh, shield uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, being accused of uh, so many uh, crimes uh, that they have really committed over the years. Uh, Israel's prolonged occupation has to be recognized. Israeli colonialism and uh, 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 the system of apartheid has to be also recognized. And as such, we do expect a huge, uh, if not historic, uh, decision that will uh, uh, expose uh, Israel's reality and forces uh, so many countries that they have been allying themselves with Israel to 
uh, reconsider uh, their relationship and their position uh, towards Israel. But as, as we were hearing in the report, the court's opinion is non-legally binding. Israel could ignore it, as it has done before. Are you hoping, at the very least, that the court's opinion will pressure Israel's allies and the international community in general to take punitive steps against it? Well, uh, of course, you know, we uh, know how Israel behaves. Israel does not uh, uh, show any... Uh, uh, you know, readiness to engage uh, with any decision that really comes from the court or outside the court, including the United Nations system. But, you know, we do put uh, a lot of uh, emphasis, expectations on, on the uh, reaction of uh, Western world countries who have been always considered to be close friends of Israel. I do believe such decision should force, uh, you know, uh, the uh, review by such countries in terms of uh, to what level they uh, could continue their relationship uh, with Israel when the moment that, you know, such uh, decision has exposed Israeli uh, policies and uh, made it very clear that, uh, you know, aligning themselves with, uh, with Israel after that decision is really tantamount to being really accomplice to the uh, crimes that uh, Israel has been really committing against the Palestinian people. There are countries who are very much, uh, they show concern, sensitivity towards uh, decisions that, you know, comes from uh, the ICJ or the ICC. Uh, and uh, as a result, you know, we are putting a lot of expectation uh, and hope that such countries, you know, will uh, consider their relationship with Israel after such decision. They will review such relationship and they will behave accordingly. You know, uh, that will... Uh, make Israel, uh, you know, uh, a pariah state, that Israel uh, will be uh, isolated from uh, the rest of the countries. We, we will take away from them, from them uh, their uh, uh, most uh, allies. And uh, for us, that's very important. That will create tremendous pressure. We are counting on uh, the legal aspect and the ethical aspect of such a decision uh, and the political one more than anything else. And uh, we believe that there are countries who cannot but abide by such uh, decision, respect such decision, and based on it, uh, they have to uh, go into a process of re reviewing their relationship with such state uh, so how, called Israel. So how, sir, will you make use of this case, this legal case, both politically and diplomatically? Well, you know, we are already engaging with uh, so many countries. The fact that 53 countries are submitting their oral presentation is uh, important. The fact that uh, such decision, when it comes out, uh, it, uh, it has to go back to the General Assembly of the United Nations. The fact that uh, there, there will be deliberations among all member states of the General Assembly. So no one could just, you know, ignore it or no one could really try to say we are not aware of it. Uh, they they have to uh, uh, exactly deal with it, and uh, probably you know we will think you know with all our friends and allies how we are going to benefit from such decision in a way. Maybe we'll go back to the General Assembly and uh, pre prepare a uh, General Assembly resolution uh, to be voted in the General Assembly in order to adopt that decision and make it you know uh, obligatory uh, on all countries you know to. Uh, uh, deal with it. Minister, many thanks indeed for being with us on Al Jazeera. That's Riyad Malki, Foreign Minister for the State of Palestine. Thank you. Thank you. We're fortunate to have guests with deep and diverse backgrounds to share their insight on this historic moment for Palestinians. Professor Ari Imses is legal counsel for the State of Palestine. He's in The Hague. Uh, in Ramallah, in the occupied West Bank, is Noor Uday. Uh, a, political, a Palestinian political analyst. And in Doha, Mehran Kamrava, a professor of government at Georgetown University in Qatar and author of the book The Impossibility of Palestine, History, Geography and the Road Ahead. A warm welcome to you all. Professor Adi Imses, let's start with uh, you. Uh, more than 50 countries and three organisations are presenting arguments at this hearing, the largest number of parties to participate in any single ICJ case since it was established. And yet the court will provide only a non-binding legal opinion later in the year. Why is that? And if the court's opinion isn't legally binding, then what's the point? Well, thanks for having me, Adrian. 
Look, uh, the principal judicial organ of the United Nations, which is the ICJ, exercises various types of jurisdiction, one of which is to give advisory opinions. Uh, these are formally not binding, you're correct, but at the same time, because it's the principal judicial organ of the United Nations and because it is the highest world court that deals with the interpretation and application of international law, what it says is tremendously valuable, highly persuasive on the international plane. There are streams of cases of this court going back years that demonstrate even when you have an advisory opinion, states have abided by them, the rulings in an advisory opinion shape what is regarded as legitimate in the political realm. And so it is a vital import to have turned to the court for an advisory opinion on the illegality of Israel's continued presence in the occupied Palestinian territory. Occupation is meant to be temporary. This one has lasted 56, now going on 57 years. It is accompanied by a regime of apartheid and racial discrimination. It is <clears throat> existentially illegal. And we hope that when the court comes down with its opinion, ideally sometime in the summer, perhaps in, Ju in July, they'll be saying the same thing. There will be consequences, political and legal, as a result. And, and what specifically are the arguments that are being put before the court right now? Palestine's case is rooted in three what we call peremptory norms of international law, derogation from which is not permitted under any circumstance. First, the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory through threat or use of force. Israel has acquired territory de facto and de jure of the state of Palestine and by its own admission and over many years. Second, the violation of the Palestinian people's right to self-determination through its acquisition of territory, through its settlement, untrammeled, uh, uh, unrepentant, um, over the past 56 years, it has violated the Palestinian people's right to self-determination in the occupied Palestinian territory. And finally, third, the imposition on the Palestinian people in the occupied Palestinian territory, and indeed on the Palestinian people, wherever they may be, of a regime of racial discrimination amounting to apartheid. Because these are peremptory norms, derogation from which is not permitted, we ask the court a simple question. How can it be that the regime that gives rise to these norms, derogation from which is not permitted, itself be lawful? No, we argue that the regime, that is, Israel's continued presence in the occupied Palestinian territory, is in and of itself an internationally wrongful act, an illegality, that can only be ended immediately, unconditionally, and forthwith. Noor Oday, uh, if Israel and its allies uh ignore the court's opinion when it is delivered, uh, as they have done before, what does that say about the court's credibility and about international law? Well, it would mean that the this whole system uh, that the world relies on to uh, uh, function, really, uh, would no longer really be relevant or, or uh, very much um, intact. And Palestine has long challenged this system because of this ex Israeli exceptionalism, because Israel has always enjoyed the protection and the complicity of very powerful allies. Um, it has um, really undermined um, everything that uh, the international system, the international law and what it stands for. It has really made all of that really come into question, more so now than we've ever seen, especially with the unfolding uh, war and the unfolding genocide in Gaza. It will be very difficult, I would say, for Israel's allies to ignore it. Perhaps the United States will be the last to join the, uh, you know, the, the march. But I think it will be very difficult for many European countries to break with precedent to break with their practice of upholding ICJ rulings, of respecting those rulings, of at least not appearing to be in contradiction with them. And in that sense, I think we might have a South Africa moment at our hand, whereby the same countries that supported apartheid had to, in the end, join the overwhelming majority of the world that said this is an illegal, immoral regime and it has to be dismantled, it has to come to an end. Nehran Kamraba, do you agree with that? How might the court's opinion impact Israel's staunchest allies? Uh, Israel may be able to ignore the court's opinion, but politically, could the US afford to do so? 
it'll be very difficult for the U.S. to ignore the ICJ's ruling. But I think it's important to keep in mind that Israel views itself as an exceptional state. And Israel's closest allies, the United States and many European states, agree with that assessment, that Israel is an exceptional state, and therefore it can ignore United Nations resolutions, it can ignore and break international law, and get away with it. The um, fact that the United States has repeatedly ignored UN Security Council resolutions, the fact that the European Union is definitely silent on the massacre of now more than 29,000 Palestinians, tells us that there's this assumption that Israel is somehow different, that international norms, international law don't necessarily apply to it. I completely agree with um, the other guests that this will increase the um, pressure on Israel's allies, but whether or not we will see some sort of compliance with this, I think remains to be seen. And Mehran, how valid is Washington's argument, and indeed Israel's, in its, in its written submission to the court, that this case is counterproductive in that it could, quote, distract the parties from the objective of a negotiated two-state solution, that weaponizing the UN system to delegitimize and criminalize Israel is not going to lead to peace? Well, uh, you know, I think only the Israelis and the Americans at this point really believe in the old... Uh, two-state solution. Uh, we've been talking about the two-state solution for a number of decades now, as we've witnessed the progressive dismantling of Palestine, the increasing depopulation of Palestinian territories, the lack of viability of a Palestinian state in terms of territorial contiguity, the spread of settlements, all under the auspices of the so-called peace process. And I think it's time that we reframe our uh, frame of reference, rethink our frame of reference, and uh, go to the ICJ, for example, or think about other ways of ending Israeli occupation uh, or bringing to some sort of recon meaningful reconciliation Israelis and Palestinians, rather than this two-state solution that the Americans and the Israelis have been talking about as they continuously dismantle Palestine. Professor Emsis, you, I saw you you're nodding there. Do you want to come in? Absolutely. Um, the point made about the what I call the negotiations condition, I've written a great deal about this, and the, the case that we brought is basically fashioned around this idea. Because the norms upon which the case is based, these peremptory norms, do not allow of any any derogation at any moment in time the violation of the principle against territorial conquest the violation of the palestinian people's right to self-determination the violation of the principle that you may not impose a regime of racial discrimination and apartheid because these principles are non-derogable under international law the regime itself is unlawful and if the uh, if the regime itself is ex existentially connected to these to these violations its end cannot be made subject to negotiation. So if your viewers want a takeaway from this case, once the court or if the court pronounces that the occupation is unlawful, under international law, that would bind the United Nations, that would bind every state on planet Earth, the end of that occupation may not be held subject or made con contingent on negotiation. And that matters, as we know, because negotiations or this negotiations condition has been held out in front of the beleaguered Palestinian people for 30 years now, uh, including by states, third states, ostensibly, who support the international rule of law, but continually tell the Palestinian people that the only way they can secure their release from bondage of Israel and, and, its, and, and its barbaric occupation now going over a half century is to negotiate with the occupying power. That is manifestly absurd. And based on the UN record, Israel's actions based on the UN record demonstrate that it doesn't operate 
nor has it ever operated in good faith, either in the occupied Palestinian territory or at the proverbial negotiations table. And so it is vital that the court make a pronouncement on the illegality of Israel's continued presence in the occupied Palestinian territory, one consequence of which will, will, will vitiate, negate, the cop-out response of third states that Palestine and the beleaguered people of Palestine need to negotiate their freedom. Their freedom is unnegotiable, their right to self-determination equally so, and that's what the International Court of Justice, we hope, will make a pronouncement on in the summer. Noor, um, forgive me for asking a personal question, but, but you grew up under occupation. I mean, many people watching this program will have no idea what, what it's like to, to, to grow up, to live under occupation. Can you tell us something of, of your experience uh, and, and the way in which Israel's occupation uh, has changed over the years or, or has impacted the, the lives of Palestinians over the years? Well, this is an important question and I'm happy to answer it. I actually grew up in forced exile uh, like many Palestine refugees. And my uh, initial childhood experience of occupation was the fact that I was denied um, entry into my homeland. I was denied my own identity. And it wasn't until well after my teenage years uh, that um, I it was easier to present myself as Palestinian without having to pick a fight with the people on the other side of the conversation to prove that Palestine actually existed. And as a young adult, when I was finally allowed into Palestine, um, and living under occupation means that uh, Israel decides where you can live, how you can live, and where you can move. It decides the routine you have on your in your day, in your week, about your grocery shopping, because your grocer and your uh, vegetable store uh, only has goods when the Israeli crossings inside the West Bank operate. So you operate on Israeli on the Israeli calendar, not the Palestinian one. Israel decides who and how you can get married. Because if you happen to have a West Bank ID and you fall in love with someone from Jerusalem, you'll have a very hard time getting married because your spouse uh, might lose their ID or your children might not have one at all. Um, if you uh, happen to fall in love with someone who carries a Gaza ID, your only option really is to move to Gaza because there is no way that they can move uh, to the West Bank, which is my lived experience. Um, so everything, every detail of life, it really is quite amazing uh, when you think about it, even for me as a Palestinian, in just how uh, much Israel intervenes into the very fabric of life that we go in day in and day out. And the only way Palestinians survive that is by rising above that, by understanding that much of their life is beyond their control, but what is under their control is staying home, is, is being in their homeland, and is looking forward and is never losing hope. I think that is the one thing that all Palestinians, regardless of geography, have in common. Uh, no, t time is tight, so I need a reasonably brief answer, if you can give me one here. In what ways does occupation uh, damaged or weakened Palestinian institutions over time? In every way imaginable, uh, because it, ha it, it has degraded their standing. Uh, Palestinian security officers can only operate if they're allowed to by the occupier. They cannot uh, provide protection from Israeli settler attacks, for example. They cannot do their job uh, uh, um, as required by law as required by the social contract. All of the institutions can only operate within the confines of Israeli permission. So in many ways, these institutions have a fight every day that they operate. And more and more with this uh, Israeli government, with the way it operates and with its proclaimed goals, it becomes impossible to operate uh, without being completely subservient. And that is why I think this case is so important, because you can't pick on one practice per se. You can't just say these practices are illegal, they're counterproductive. The whole regime in its entirety uh, makes living 
while Palestinian a fight every single day. And it is unbearable, it is not sustainable, and it simply is incompatible with anything uh, resembling peace and stability, not just for Palestinians, but for everybody in this region. Professor Kamrava, as we said at the, the beginning of the program, this case is separate from South Africa's genocide case, which the ICJ is also considering. But there, there are bound to be, there's bound to be a measure of overlap between the two cases, uh, isn't there? Absolutely. And this will only um, ratchet up pressure on Israel and uh, its uh, allies, its uh, those who are complicit in the ongoing ethnic cleansing, uh, the Americans and the Europeans. But again, I think it's important to keep in mind that as we speak, as these cases unfold, there is an absolute bloodbath going on in Gaza. And Israel's onslaught on the Palestinians has been unrelenting. And therefore, there is an absolute need for a very quick ceasefire in the immediate future. We cannot afford to wait until the summer when the judgment of the ICJ is out. Mehran Kamrava, uh, Professor Imsis was talking there about, about the ongoing war in Gaza, of course, but, but where South Africa's genocide complaint to the court centre solely on, on Gaza, this case is also looking at the, the occupied West Bank, isn't it? Um, yes, it is. Uh, as was just said uh, by the good professor, uh, the situation in Gaza, horrible, uh, unprecedented, though it is, is a symptom of a larger problem. And one of those problems, the root causes of the problem, is the illegal occupation, but not just that. It's the regime of apartheid and racial discrimination imposed on the Palestinian people as a whole since 1948, wherever they are. And so the focus of this case is strategic. It's about looking at the regime, as uh, Noor had mentioned earlier, and the legality of the regime imposed by Israel, the occupying power on the Palestinian people, primarily in the occupied Palestinian territory, though not exclusive to that. Now, there's a difference between the two cases. One is an advisory opinion case and therefore will be dispensed by the court relatively quickly. As I said, we anticipate an order of the court or rather an opinion of the court to be issued by summer. But the other case is a contentious case, a dispute between two states, South Africa and Israel. And that will take some years to deal with the merits of the claim being made that is, whether Israel is violating its obligations under the Genocide Convention. What we do know in that case is based on the order given by the court on the 26th of January, just a few weeks back, that the court is of the view that it is plausible that Israel is committing genocide under the Genocide Convention against the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip. And so time is of the essence. Law is one thing, and we're doing our okay. best to use it and utilize it to save people. But what we need is a ceasefire. And that's a political okay. matter, and we need to press for that globally. There, I'm afraid we must end it. We're out of time. Many thanks indeed to all of uh, our guests today, Riyad Malki, Adi Imsis, Noor Ode, and uh, Mehran Kamrava. As always, thank you for watching. You can see the programme again at any time by going to the website, which you'll find at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, join us at our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And, of course, you can join the conversation on X, our handle there, at AJ Inside Story from me, Adrian Finnegan, and the team here in Doha. We'll see you again. Bye for now.